And thank you very much and apologies for that technical issue. And uh, just on the last question, one thing that always helped me um, understand the difference between unplanned and uh, planned patients is the fact that um, we don't know the names of those unplanned patients, but we do know the names of the electors we're bringing in. You know, actually both planned and unplanned is predictable. And clearly at this moment, we're working through different um, impacts, but even so we're starting to see trends. So I just thought I wanted to throw that in because that's helped in my mind that actually both, mod both, both types of patients are um, easy to identify, just we don't know the names of those yet who come into our EDs. So on to my part of the uh, presentation is to just try, and one good thing about um, um, going after the last presentation, I've heard some more words that I think it's really important, I've just taken a note of, and uh, you know, crowding an ED or patients in, held in ambulances, balancing of risk and uh, you know, predicting demand and uh, you know, putting the investment in, otherwise there will be an impact to not doing something. You know, all, all of these different scenarios which play out day in, day out, and so what's really important when we're thinking about, if we go to the next slide, please, the um, our operating model and support framework, whether that's um, local, regional, national, how do we try and put ourselves into the best situation so that we are able to ensure that those sort of, um, you know, uh, outcomes are, are, aren't happening and, and, and systems feel supported and able to try and put in place the mitigating actions um, to um, support flow. So if you go to the next slide. Right, so um, what I'm trying to show here is that we've got obviously different levels within the operating model of the system. So depending on where, where you are and um, on, uh, for those on this call, whether you're in the local system, regional, or indeed like myself and maybe some other colleagues on, on, on here from the national team in terms of you know, what's expected, you know, what do we use and what's the support and intervention that will happen as a result. But I think it's first important to say that, you know, whether you're a, a manager, clinician, et cetera, if you work in the NHS, you tend to have gone through some form of mandatory training. And, you know, if you think back to, um, you know, some of that mandatory training, whether that's fire training or basic life support, you know, we're told right at the beginning, the first rule is to call for help. And, uh, you know, as an example, you know, you, you, you know you, before you start trying to deal with the problem yourself, you know, you start to then um, put a call out for help and then, um, and then um, go to support. And I think it's the same sort of principle when we go to think about escalation in terms of, well, you know, we, we've got a situation, we may or may not be able to, to, to manage it, but to avoid some of that potential um, um, uh, outcomes that we, we don't want to see, let's call for help. And at that stage, it may not be that you know what sort of help you, you require, but at least you've been able to call on others to um, support in your decision making and indeed provide a shared decision making um, so that everyone has a common understanding of the situation and indeed the, um, the range of solutions and therefore what the expected outcome should be. And then you'll see in terms of um, those three structures here, what we try to do is make sure that we have the ability to dock into um, each layer within the, uh, within the NHS structure. And, um, and that should be um, in terms of uh, you know, roles, in terms of um, making sure that we use the same sort of language. And indeed, importantly, and this is probably the most important one, is using the same information. So that there is, um, depending on the on the on your role, you'll have a different view, whether it's um, a national view or whether you're in the region, the regional view or a local system, just your local CCG. But nevertheless, making sure that we're consistent in our data source and that sort of thing helps to ensure that there's clarity, reduce confusion, and indeed, importantly, ensure that we've got um, the um, the right actions and response in, in place. In terms of um, the sort of um, models that we have, so we normally traditionally will have a, a summer model. And as of today, we've moved into our winter operating model where we will be, where we operate seven days a week, 24 seven. Obviously it has been slightly different this year with having to continue to report on a daily basis and have ICC structures in place. Um, but there is still a, a slight change in our operating model. And indeed, um, from a national to regional local um, basis, everyone has aligned themselves to that. So again, that's that docking in 
um, expectation, knowing that over the winter period that there is traditionally more um, stress within the system, and indeed, as we heard from our first colleagues from Arkham, even more so, although you, as, as colleagues did say, you know, there's probably stuff that we can do to prevent some of that that's currently happening, and hopefully uh, through this presentation you'll uh, hear some of that. If we go to uh, the next slide, uh, please. A lot of words on here, so I really do not intend to uh, read through that slide. And um, and probably if you go to the next slide, because um, uh, it's just about the Opal framework. So uh, the Opal framework is our national um, framework that's in place. First introduced for winter 16-17 and then uh, refreshed in uh, 2018. And um, we've decided that we will keep to the Opal framework. And we made that decision very early um, in wave one because um, actually it is, um, um, you know, um, it is used cons consistently across local systems. It's understood and indeed, you know, trying to do something fundamentally different during this period um, probably wouldn't be um, uh, appropriate. But um, for those who um, are involved in managing the incident, uh, in May, we have introduced a, um, a an, like an EPRR type guidance, which is to support um, decision making where the OPAL framework won't necessarily um, lend itself. So, for example, if you take um, uh, the real example, I won't name the trust, but back in May, where um, due to um, uh, testing internally, that resulted in a, on a significant number of staff having to go off sick and um, to isolate. That therefore caused the hospital to um, to close to emergency um, uh, activity and indeed cancel electives for a week and was trying to secure some mutual aid across the system. But because from a OPAL framework perspective, they weren't um, triggering OPAL 4 because you know, like most hospitals back in May, there was a really good availability of, of beds, etc. that the decision was delayed to try and support that system because of the framework. So, so, so in, in, in terms of, of, of managing the pandemic, the OPAL framework clearly um, does not lend itself to that. So that's why the other um, framework has been put in place um, in May to manage um, um, incidences um, where there's been a service change due to COVID related uh, incidents and therefore the two can work side by side. So, um, so the refresh in 2018 and, um, and importantly, I think improved in terms of giving some clarity in terms of how sy systems should respond together to really show that um, actually in terms of getting that consistency of support across all providers within the system, how a, the overall OPAL status can um, move up or indeed um, be de-escalated um, based on um, some an acute provider maybe at Opal 4 if you've got you know other providers at Opal 1 you could probably argue that there's probably something that could be done differently that they need to change their Opal status because they've got to change some of their normal service to then divert some more of that resource into the acute so we wanted to try and bring out some of that expectation so that everyone is seen to be um, shown through their um, framework and clear actions that are being done um, to demonstrate everyone is doing what they can to de-escalate a, a situation. If we go to, um, and it provides that consistent uh, approach across across the regions, I think it's very important um, to finish on that. The NAC, um, I will spend a bit more, the last part of my presentation on, on, on the NAC. So the National Ambulance Coordination Centre, this is quite um, exciting, I have to say, in terms of the level of information this gives us. So this is a, um, a tool that we um, introduced nationally um, to support us going into winter last year. And um, unfortunately, last, uh, last winter, we were clearly um, having um, unacceptable delays and congestion in our EDs with corridor care um, happening in far too many frequent, uh, at frequency and, and number of sites. And indeed, also seeing um, significant delays um, with patients being held in the back of ambulances um, or indeed in cohort areas. So all of those three scenarios clearly not acceptable. 
and um, it's quite challenging with the level of the of, of information that we've got to understand in kind of like real time um, whether there's pressure um, happening in our EDs. Um, the A and E sit up. Yes, as I said, we've been collecting it daily, but it is um, 24 hours in arrears. It's out of date by the time it's submitted. It's out of date by the time we see it um, once it's been um, put through all of the you know the the sausage machine, as it were. So um, it helps obviously give you a bit of an understanding. And yes, you can use a SIP rep as a kind of predictive tool in terms of a bit like previous colleagues saying, you look at historical trends and you kind of work out, well, actually, if this hospital has, you know, that sort of occupancy, this level of demand, lo low discharges going into the weekend, we know what normally happens with our friends in System X or, or System Y. But what it doesn't do is actually enable us though to understand some of those in-day pressures and therefore in day solutions that need to happen quickly to enable our um, EDs to run effectively and avoid some of those consequences that colleagues from Arkem um, alluded to earlier on in this um, webinar. So working through with uh, the MAC, what we decided to do is to see whether we can test ourselves by providing a, um, a set of um, data that we can use to help us on a throughout the um, 24 hour period to see whether there is um, any way of identifying congestion. But importantly, apart from that, is understanding that we've always got the ability to respond to a CAT1 um, call, i.e. we've always got an, uh, an ambulance available to respond to uh, an emergency. So if we go to uh, the next slide, this is the NAC dashboard. Um, so what we what we've what we've got now, and it's slightly improved since then. This is a an old screenshot, but in essence, what this does for uh, what this shows you is the is a national view, and what we've got here is a is the national view of um, of the ambulance providers as a snapshot at that point in time. So every thirty minutes, we get a live feed from each of the uh, the ten ambulance providers. And that goes into this National Coordin Ambulance Coordination Centre. And what they then do is pull that into this template. And what the template does for us is give us a, an understanding of now, of, of pressures now. And so we understand the REAP level of the ambulance service, which doesn't change every day, but the search level, the in-day search response. So, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, but then importantly, we start to then understand the response time. So the CAT1 mean response time and the number of instance waiting. So what you may hear is called as the, referred to as the stack. And, and what you can see here, is, is, is different numbers across the providers. Now, you know, naturally you might go to the number which has got which the, the provider the biggest number, but actually you've got to also think about the size of the ambulance provider. So what we then have to do is extrapolate upwards to actually compare by the size, actually the, the 80 in the North East, actually that actually might be worse than the 250 because of what of, of the size of the ambulance service. So in essence, what we understand that, you know, as a snapshot, there are 80, patients waiting um, to have a response by. We also want to understand how many ambulances are on duty. Uh, sorry, my, well, I need to go to spec savers. I was reading the wrong line. So 30, I think it was for the North East. So sorry for any North East colleagues for making your position worse. Uh, but you had 80 ambulances on duty at that time. And what we can see here is how many RVs were available and how many uh, actual ambulances are available at that point in time, unallocated and able to respond to a an emergency call, should that, that be the, the need. But importantly, we can now start to see how many um, ambulances are held at our uh, Aratton Hospital and how many of those ambulances, and at this point, the zero, uh, note one at Lincoln there, how many are over the hour? So then we can start to understand through this um, update, which I said is updated every half hour, and we have it on our phones, um, where there is building pressure. Where we've got, and, and the sites that are populated have slightly changed, so through the National Ambulance Handover Delay Programme, which is chaired by our National SRO for Ambulances, Anthony Marsh, um, we have agreed with regional ambulance providers and regional uh, UEC leads, the sites where we know that there's um, always the most significant, unfortunate congestion and ambulances held at, um, held, um, not handed over within agreed times. So what we do is then pre-populate those sites so that, because these are the ones that we're probably going to be featuring. And and if a hospital that isn't part of that program, uh, if they have two or more, then they become part of, of, of that. So that enables us in a, it, it, to 
um, with the limitations of the SITREP to give us a really good understanding of in-day pressures. And what was really good to um, see last winter is when we were uh, using this is to then see, you know, within an hour, some differences, start to see those ambulances go away because we were able to see um, immediately what was happening. And in terms of, if we go to the next slide, my last slide, sorry if I'm overrunning, he said, how do we actually use this information? So as you as, as I started off my, um, my, my, my my section by saying that we always need to make sure we dock into something so that all of our structures are aligned in terms of response, um, what our expectations are. So is um, this the, the, the NAC is available to everyone um, who has a role in their system to um, support um, any decision making out of hours or escalation clearly the view that you will get will be restricted to um, your pa your patch um, but nevertheless that's something that we are absolutely um, clear that we would like um, local systems to have access to because what has as what you can see in this flow chart in terms of how we then use that to help and respond is the next I mentioned they they pull in this um, data every 30 minutes and then what they first do is clearly there might be as ever some data quality issues but what they'll do is they'll phone up that applicable um, duty manager for that app for say Zcam and they will say oh we've just seen your upload and uh, you know do you want to just talk us through the numbers at Brighton because they look a bit interesting and they might say oh gosh yes blimey that was a typo that should have just been one not twelve or it might be yeah there are five ambulances being held but um, our bronze is on site, been to the site meeting and actually we're quite confident that there's going to be 10 beds coming up and, you know, we've got pa pa um, patients in A&E allocated and site managers down there moving. We don't need any support. Or it might be, mm, there might there's a bit more work that needs to be done. Give us an hour. Local NHS -E or CCGs are supporting. And if we don't feel confident that local decision making and escalation is going to support will escalate. After an hour, that's when national and regional, national is informed and regional on calls are then expected to try and support so that quite rapidly we are able to hopefully either reduce any of the delays that are currently happening at a hospital site and importantly have access to any national expertise that is available 24 hours to support any um, problem solving or mitigation that may be required and that could be agreeing to mutual aid etc. So that's um, it from the lead mark.